Hey guys, it's Chris, and I'm back with a Raised by Wolves video, episode two, Pentagram. And uh, the show's getting pretty damn good, so I'm still here. I'm still here after the first three episodes. I've watched all three now, and uh, we'll pick up next Thursday for episode four. So this is definitely worth watching, I think, at this point, um, unless something drastic happens in the next couple episodes where it kind of lose interest or whatever. But I don't think I will. This is pretty damn cool. It's kind of a mixture of an original Westworld season one vibe with, you know, Alien, Sci-Fi, Dune, all that kind of mixed together in a conglomerate. So, uh, so far, uh, pretty good. So let's jump into a Raised by Wolves episode two, Pentagram. <laughs> All right, so we open up and we get a flashback, uh, kind of a time jump, I suppose, back to the war. I think it was 2145 in Boston. You see the city's decimated, and you find out about these droids called Necromancers. And we get a lot of answers, actually, these last couple episodes. We find out that's what Mother actually is. She's not just your run-of-the-mill service droid, kind of like Father is. She is a Necromancer, and... She is a badass. Like I said, kind of a lady Iron Man type of character. But she has these screams that are deadly. I think that's a pretty cool tool. And you so you hear that in the background throughout the war uh, scenes and stuff like that. And then you hear her coming later on as well when she goes to get the medicine in episode three. I thought that was pretty cool. But we find out that Ragnar is not really Ragnar. So Ragnar and his wife are actually atheists who basically killed the real Ragnar and his wife and to jump on board this ship called Heaven, the Ark as they call it. And this is where it really starts to get interesting. You find out these people are not really who they say they are, but they you know, they have this kid and at first they're like, oh Lord, we don't want to deal with a kid. We don't know how to raise a kid type of thing. But to do this to save their own asses. But in the meantime, when they do get on the ship, uh, you know, you find out you have a kid and they're able to interact for this 13 year journey in a holodeck, essentially from Star Trek, where essentially you're plugged into the matrix while you're hibernating or whatever, and you can interact and they get to know this kid and it's a 13 year trip. So of course they come to love this kid. And that's, what's really cool about, you know, the next couple of episodes, you're starting to get into this gray area where these atheists that are pretending to be believers, they're really on the same side as mother, who of course we find out is a necromancer who really want to protect the children. So I think that's pretty interesting that we already know as an audience, they kind of have the same goal, but they just don't know it yet. We find out a bit more about this religion of the believers. They worship a God named Soul, uh, hence the sun emblazoned on their uniforms and all that good stuff as well. Uh, it looks like it's pretty much based off Christianity, Catholicism uh, to be specific. I, I had a comment in the first video uh, or one of the trailer videos that said, I don't want to watch a show that kind of just makes atheists out to be bad people. And I responded and said, I think it'll go a little bit deeper than that. That's exactly what it's doing. It's kind of showing both sides of the coin there. You know, you have your, your good and bad people on either side of this type of philosophical argument about, you know, religion versus atheism or science versus religion. You know, one of the oldest arguments uh, there, there is in modern times as far as pop culture. But they're doing it in a way where they're exposing flaws on both sides. So I think that's really good. They're not overdoing it with, like, atheists are bad or, you know, Christians or idiots or whatever, that kind of stuff. So it's a good balance there. Um, so I'm really digging the character so far. And you're finding yourself kind of getting invested in the characters as well. We head back to Kevlar 22B and we see, we continue seeing these damn holes. I'm telling you, there's something going on with the holes. We'll get to that in episode three, a little bit more in depth, I believe. But uh, we were introduced to these creatures. And I don't think at first I thought, cause I couldn't really see them well, they're just some kind of four-legged animal, but I'm starting to believe there's something a little more intelligent than just some random animal on this planet. They mentioned that they had been there 12 years and didn't know of anything that lived there, and all of a sudden now they're here, almost at the same time as the Ark crashing. So could it be something that you know came off the Ark that they were carrying? Could it be something that because they crashed into the ground in a, probably a deep-ass hole... Did it awaken some creatures? We find out a little bit more about Mother, that, you know, again, that she's a necromancer, but she seems to get her power from her eyes, so she literally has to swap out her eyes. And that goes back into who in the hell actually programmed her. Somebody reprogrammed a necromancer. As you found out, they were on the other side. They were on the believer's side in the war, as we saw with Ragnar and his wife. Uh, they were in the, you know, they didn't have the, the believer's um, armor on and everything in the war flashback in Boston. And remember, Cambion's name comes from the person who apparently created the droids in the first place. So that's something that's going to come into a play as well, is finding out who this person is. And they keep talking about nobody's been able to ever hack a necromancer. We also have Father Return. So we have, this is what I mean, kind of the morally gray stuff. Even with an android, she actually, mother I mean, actually revives Father when he, she gets a new power pack from this other 
droid that she had killed uh, in episode one. So she brings him back to help raise, you know, batch two of the children that she had basically saved off the Ark, which she crashed in the first place. So technically that would be kidnapping, I guess. So see, a lot of, a lot of morally gray areas. She saved their lives, but she crashed their ship and killed their families. So that's, uh, yeah, that's not necessarily saving the children. So then there was a little bit more set up in this episode as well. We had, you know, them kind of getting acclimated, the children, I mean, to their new home now. They're not really accepting mother. They can kind of see through her. They know she's dangerous. And they kind of get camping uh, in this same boat where she's starting to believe, wait a minute, she don't really care about me. She's never really been protecting me. We'll talk about that in episode three because we actually get the answer to that as well. But she's like setting up the rules. There's no religion allowed. There's no praying allowed. You know, you're free from these rules about religion. They're sitting there eating their grits. Apparently, that's what it is uh, on Kevlar. 22B is, you know, southern style grits is what they have for dinner. Looks fine to me. Just add a little butter. In the room where she actually hides her eyes and actually shows father, which was another moment where it's like, okay, she really does kind of care or her programming is allowing her to care. You know, she shares that she has these eyes, but she's going to keep them to it just in case they're, you know, attacked again by these creatures. So she shares that with him, and we see the drawings in there, and there was a drawing of a damn snake coming out of one of those fucking holes. I'm telling you, that was foreshadowing. There's something going on with these holes. More about that in episode three as well. And again, I don't necessarily think it's the snakes, but there's something with these holes. There's people down there. There's some other race down there. And these animals are not just like dumbass animals looking for a meal. I mean, maybe they are in some sense, but I think they're part of a bigger storyline. We're about to find out something that's going on underground on this damn planet. We did find out an interesting fact about the 13-year journey, because I hadn't even thought about it in episode one, that everybody's about 13 years older than what they look. So the kids, you know, you got a kid that's looking, you know, six or seven years old, actually more like, you know, 20 years old or whatever, because the trip takes 13 years and their bodies don't age like that. So that's pretty interesting to think about. So they're essentially, they're still children, don't really matter. But I thought that was a little interesting tidbit. And essentially to wrap up episode two, you find out one of these girls is pregnant from being apparently uh, getting the R word done to her on the ship on the way from some cleric. I think that's a little call out to some of the Catholic issues in recent years or whatever, but that's going to be an important detail, I think, because she's going to be the first one to have a natural birth, if assuming she makes it, on this planet. So that will be some type of thing. The prophecy thing is still in play with Cambian being this kid in a barren land or whatever. So something's coming up with that. We'll talk about that a little bit more in episode three. But this is where the boy, uh, one of the children, start to kind of get in Campion's head and all the other ones saying, you know, look, she's the one who killed your friends. It wasn't some random thing. And that's what starts making him kind of rebel against his parents, essentially, just like any child in real life. So I think that's really good parallels there. People can relate to that. Their children rebelling uh, from them, even if you have the best intentions. And it really made you question, maybe, maybe something she's doing is actually killing them. And maybe she don't know it, or maybe it's some form of programming. She even mentioned that to Father herself, uh, I believe, in Episode 3, when they do find out the answer to that. And then the basically the end of Episode 2 is you find out that Ragnar had gotten near one of these holes because they were apparently warm. And uh, these two creatures, that's what I mean. They didn't come up and just start eating him. These two creatures came up and knocked him off the edge, almost like it was a joke. And he fell down into the hole. But, of course, he had wrapped a rope around him like a bungee cord. He gets knocked out or whatever. And then he has saved the survivors from the crash from the Ark or whatever. Plus, you had some other landing parties. So now you got a, a kind of a group of humans that are going after these children, trying to save their children from the androids who are also trying to save the children. So that's where it gets really kind of crazy and interesting. They're really all trying to do the same thing, but they just because of religious differences, they can't seem to just have a conversation. Really parallels the real world right now. Anyway, guys, let me know what you think in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching. Really appreciate the continued support. Thank you to all my patrons on Patreon. Really appreciate it. You keep this channel going. And if you dig what I do here, please give these videos a like, comment, and a share. And be sure to hit that subscribe button below and smash that notification bell as well so you're notified when I drop a new video. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.